guys, welcome back to Revive School. Here we are, the second lesson of the Gospel of Mark. Our one word, remember, we're doing one word for each book of the Bible. Totally gonna throw you off on a curveball. Ready, Drew? Leviticus. Um, fireball. <laughs> <laughs> Atonement. Atonement. Yes. Okay, Kevin, Deuteronomy. Prophet. Cars. Deliverer. <laughs> What did you say, Rich? Deliver. Who said cars? Me. Oh, man. It's profit. Matthew. Mark. Uh, no. <laughs> okay, I can see we're not getting anywhere. Our point is we're trying to create an atmosphere where you can learn, have fun. The gospel of Mark. Well, first of all, Matthew is king. Mark is servant. That's where we're going to go. I'm not asking you guys anything else right now. So the one word for Mark is servant. Anybody know how to say servant in Spanish? Servir. Really? That's to serve. Okay, that sounds good. That's what we're after, to, to understand Mark 10, 45. Jesus said, I did not come to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom. He's giving himself up. And so we want to paint a picture in Mark 1. Remember, his success is growing. As the next thing you know, he's, he's healing people. He's casting out demons. That's what this picture is, is, you know, the touch of Christ, the touch of a servant. And so as a, as a result, people are literally showing up at his door. In fact, it says all of the town. That's the process, but now, you know what happens whenever you begin to gain favor, right? You always get opposition. In Mark 2, we're gonna to begin to talk about some of this opposition that's raising up as Jesus continues to go into his mission, as he begins to teach, because there's a lot of that. In Mark 2, verse one. Verse one, it says, when he entered Capernaum again, after some days, remember, this is his headquarter, this is his home base, it says it was reported that he was at home. We don't know if this is implying Peter's home, we don't know if he had like a rental property. No, I'm kind of serious. We, we don't know. We just know that Capernaum served as his headquarters. Rich, do you remember the name of our friend that works at the gate of Capernaum when you come into Jesus' town today? Ah, uh, yeah, but it meant war. Jihad. Yeah, that's right. Jihad. Uh, we met a guy named Jihad. We go, what is your name? Jihad. <laughs> There's a guy named Jihad today outside of Capernaum, which is Jesus's hometown. You can actually visit what they would say, one of the, the, the oldest, uh, earliest homes that maybe Peter, maybe Peter lived and obviously a synagogue that would have been built on where Christ could have been. But it says that he was at home and while he was there in verse two, okay? This is kind of the introduction to the rest of the chapter. So many people gathered together, there was no more room. So this popularity of Christ, the word that continues to spread, like it's, it's ongoing. In fact, so as many people, it says that there was no room. People were gathering, not even in the doorway. And, and he was speaking the message to them. All right. Are you guys with me here? Many people gathered together. There's no more room, not even in the doorway. What does that mean? Not even in the doorway? Like people cannot even, you know, how like you stand kind of like in the back and like, hey, hmm, wonder what's going on over there. Like that's not even an option. Kind of that makes me think of Kokomo, Indiana. When we did Revive Indiana, right? And we had uh, people playing it on the radio, sitting in the car in the parking lot of the church because the doorways were full. We had five buses that came from one community, packed out the outside. People were peering through the windows. Like when the gospel advances and the spirit of God takes over, everybody, it seems like, wants this message. And then in verse three, here's what happens. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic, carried by four men. Okay, now let's back up. If the room is full, they can't even get into the doorway. It says, they came to Jesus being a, bringing a paralytic. Kevin, we already said, just for the visual sake, you're our paralytic today, okay? So Kevin's a paralytic, and then we are the four guys. Rich, Drew, uh, TJ, and I, we are the four friends. And we're carrying you, Kevin. <laughs> Kevin, what, what is going on over there, Kevin? Kevin has rigor mortis. He's not a paralyzed person. I don't know what that means. Okay, so now these four men. Okay, it's, it's almost like they're frantic, as Dr. Tom Constable says, they're frantic to get their friend to Jesus. They care so much about the issues that Kevin has, the paralytic, that we want to get him to Jesus. And here's the crazy thing is, as we get into verse four, you're gonna find out they're not even concerned about the physical environment. They don't care whatever they're doing. In fact, in Mark two, verse four, it says, since they weren't able to bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, I love this. I think they had a strategy. Drew, Drew would be sitting in the back. All right, I think, I think we should go this way. And I can imagine Rich just coming up with his construction head. You know, he's like, oh, hey, let's remove the roof here. We could go at an angle here. Like everybody, and TJ would be like, I'll just carry Kevin. You know, and then I would be like. I don't even have a belt and I'm gonna carry him. Oh yeah. <laughs> and I would be like, guys, we can do this. <laughs> 
You know, I don't know, whatever. These are all of our roles. And so since they couldn't get to Jesus, they removed the roof above where he was. Now, in America, you're like, oh, that's kind of weird. Like, get out the chainsaw, get out a sawzall. Like, what, what are we, what are we, like cutting through the roof? It's totally different back then. They removed the roof above where he was. Now, this is kind of what it looked like back then, okay? I'm just going to read what MacArthur wrote. Most homes back then had flat roofs, okay? So, um, in fact, uh, during a cool day, they would actually go up to the roof just to relax. Now, during the, the hot nights, they'd go up there to sleep. Like, this was a part of their home. It wasn't like, oh, we don't ever go to the roof. Okay, they had an external stairway that was pretty, pretty common in what you're going to see there. Now, here's, here's where the, the rich comes into play, the builder mentality, okay? The builder, what would happen is, is he would spread a uniform coat of finish, and a, a wet dry would be over these, a wet clay, excuse me, over these slabs of hardened clay to serve as a seal against the rain. Okay, but now the paralytic friends, what they did is they took him up to the top of the of the house and they would dig out the top coat of clay is what they would do. They would remove several of the slabs until they made enough room to lower him into Jesus's presence. So it sounds like a lot and it is a lot, but it's more way more doable back then than it probably would be now. I mean, if you're cutting through the roof now, you're going through rafters, then you might have to go through an attic. You might have to move people's suitcases and all the storage stuff up there, the Christmas stuff. <laughs> you know, so the point is, is that the four friends cared so much about the paralytic, they weren't concerned about damage. They didn't, that wasn't even a thought on their mind. And in fact, it said they didn't care. Oh, watch out for the dirt. Like they didn't even care if it's falling on people. And you know, people felt it. Like, hey, when, wait, what's going on up there? Like, you know that this was taking place. And what I love is, is they did this because they were concerned for their friend. And here's the favorite line that I really appreciate, as one commentator said, is that they didn't just pray about seeing change for their friend. They pursued it. Now, I understand you can pray and sometimes there's not a lot much you can, you can do. But if Jesus is in the middle of, of your presence and you have a chance to get to him and you have a chance to see your friend healed, they're like, we're in. Let's go. And that's kind of the, the fun picture about what we see taking place. So to go back to verse four, it said, when they had broken through the roof, they lowered the stretcher on which the paralytic was lying. Now, I'd like to go to my engineers here. Rich, how do you think they lowered the stretcher? How, do, how did we lower Kevin if they're on the roof? I don't know. My guess is they probably had some sort of ropes and they just like wrapped it underneath the stretcher and they had a bunch of toms up there and just lowered him down. <laughs> Hit a bunch of toms? What if Kevin fell off? Well, I'm already he, paralyzed. Yeah, he couldn't feel it. He's already paralyzed. I'm already paralyzed. <laughs> <laughs> All right, verse five, Matthew, uh, I'm sorry, Mark two, seeing their faith. So Jesus sees their faith. Jesus told the paralytic, and you probably knew they're up on the roof. I, I mean, I can just picture a bunch of blue collar guys. Hang on, hang on, you okay down there? You know, like they're just hollering. And Jesus obviously just saw what they were doing. And so he told the paralytic, so he's talking to the paralytic, not to their friends, son, your sins are forgiven. That, that was his, his first line. And you know, I love what Wearsby does. We, uh, actually, this is Kent Hughes. Kent Hughes describes this process about how Jesus he, first of all, he looks up. I think this is kind of a cool thing. I'm, I'm going to write this down. This is how Jesus does ministry in this. He looks up. Why? Because of the roof. And then it just says, he looks down. <laughs> Jesus looks up. He looks down. As he looks down, he looks at the paralytic and he says, son, your sins are forgiven. I want to walk through this whole, your sins are forgiven deal. This is kind of a big deal because most Jews back then, and I think, I think, sub, what's that word? Subliminally? Subliminally? I think some, or so subconsciously, maybe even too, uh, I think, you know, when we hear about somebody that is sick, sometimes you have to wonder, let's just say it's in your own family. You wonder, gosh, what did I do wrong? Or you think, is there anything that I brought this on myself? Or is there a sin? I think we just naturally think that. The Jews back then believed that when you got a disease or an affliction, it was because of one sin. That was kind of the mentality back then. And I'll come back to that, that sin issue and, and disease because obviously that's not the case all the time. Uh, you know what, Kevin, I'm going to come back to this. Hang on. Let me go there now. Go to John 9, 1, if you would, please. John 9, 1. Obviously, sins are not always the root of, uh, or he your health issues are not always the root of um, sins. But look in John 9, 1. It says, as he was passing by, he saw my, a man blind from birth. Verse 2. 
uh, his disciples questioned him, Rabbi, who sinned? See, right here's the automatic thought of the disciples. Who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? And then in verse 3, I love Jesus' answer. He says, neither this man nor his parents sinned. And Jesus answered, this came about so that God's works might be displayed in him. The, the tendency in the culture was that this paralytic did something of sin, of a sinful nature. He had some issues that brought about this. But in John 9, it very clearly says, no, 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 that's not the case at times. It's because I want to show who God is. I want to get, give God the glory in this situation. Okay, so it's kind of up, up in the air. Now, obviously, if there's certain conditions like, you know, transmitted diseases that come because of people living in a sinful nature. Yes, those are the kind of things that people are going to bring on themselves. But there's some things like completely out of control. Like my daughter, Maya, when she was 18 months old, came down with a rare blood disease. My first thought was, gosh, was there an area in my life that I didn't address? Was there an area of life that my parents or my grandparents? And, and then you go to the John 9, 1 through 3 passage and then you can breathe. And you're like, okay, it's not. But human, say, human nature just says, well, what does that look like? And that's what the Jews dealt with. And so when you say and you hear Jesus saying, your son, your sins are forgiven, man, I'd be like, cool, because then that implies right away I'm going to lead to healing. So here's what I want to do today. How completely, what, this is what John MacArthur writes, how completely does God forgive repentant sinners? Like, if he says your sins are forgiven, is it like legit? Is it like complete? And so I want to give you five, really five verses, but it's more five points that show you how much God can remove your sin. Okay, this is a big deal. In verse, I'm sorry, Kevin, go to Psalm 103, verse 12. One of the roles that the servant plays, that Jesus plays, is that he removes... Okay, transgression, trans, excuse me, transgressions, transgressions as far as, do you know where I'm going with this one, Rich? The east is, east from, the is from the west. East is from the west. And that's what it says in Psalm 103, 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Like, as far as you can see from the east to the west, your sin is removed. Your transgressions are removed. This is the mindset when he says to son, your sins are forgiven. This is the backdrop that we need to have. Okay, it also says this. God will cast sins. This is going to sound kind of funny. Behind his back. Isaiah 38, 17. Indeed, it was for my own welfare that I had such great bitterness. But your love has delivered me from the pit of destruction. And look what happens. For you have thrown all of my sins. Don't you love this? Behind your back. God just says, it's done, it's gone. Everything from the east to the west, and oh, by the way, behind my back. <laughs> it's a great image. So when God says, son, your sins are forgiven, this is the mentality, because we didn't have the New Testament, right? All we had was the Psalms, all we had was, you know, in this context, the prophet Isaiah. They knew, if they knew the word of God, they were like, yes, I am being set free. And also, this is kind of cool, if you go to Isaiah 43, verse 25, God remembers sins, no more. It is I who sweep away your transgressions. I love that, just that image. I'm just, I sweep away your transgressions for my own sake and remember your sins no more. As far as the east to the west, behind my back, and oh, by the way, now I'm just, I'm sweeping them away and they're, they're completely gone. I don't, I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> I remember your sins no more. So when he says, son, your sins are forgiven. You're on a, you're, you're a paralytic, you're on a stretcher. Like, this is the thoughts that go through his mind. Okay, we got two more here. Okay, number four. What happens? Uh, how completely does God forgive repentant sinners? It says that he cast, Kevin, if you go to uh, Micah 7, 19. It says that he cast sins into the depths of the sea. And so in Micah 7, verse 19, when he says, Son, your sins are forgiven, this is the image that he has. He will again have compassion on us. He will vanquish our iniquities and you will cast all of our sins into the depths of the sea. I don't know if you guys have ever been out on an ocean or deep sea fishing or, you know, any of that kind of component. When we talk about deep sea, like we're talking like it's just, it feels almost dark out there, doesn't it? It's so, it's just like, how far does this go down? And that mentality is, and this is what I like about this, okay? Remember this, east, west, behind you, no more. And oh, by the way, all the way down there is going to keep going and going and going and going. It's gone. Like, it's like he's covering every single direction. Now what I want to do is how completely does, does God forgive repentant sinners? The last one is I want to use the, the New Testament model. 
Kevin, we go to Colossians 2, 13 through 14. Here's what happens next. He nailed a certificate. He nailed a certificate marked, what? Paid in full. And then how did it happen? Where did he put it down? To the cross. Think about this, you guys. In Matthew 27, we talked about the crucifixion. And then we talked about because he came back to life, those things are done. This is what we're talking about. In Colossians 2.13, it says, And when you were dead in trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive with him and he forgave us all our trespasses. Verse 14 says, He erased the certificate of debt with its obligations that was against us, you ready for this, and opposed to us, and he's taken it out of the way by nailing it to the cross. So how completely does God forgive repentant sinners? When people are there and he says, I will forgive your sins, he will remove it as far as the east and the west. And I, I just think this is important because some of us, even watching today, maybe you're in your car, you're on your way to work today. Maybe you're in your bathroom, you've got the video on right now, uh, and you're just, you're processing and you're listening to life. Maybe you're listening on the radio. The reason I'm bringing this up is because some of us don't feel like God can forgive us of all of our sins. Yeah, but you don't understand. Like, there's some things that I've done. You guys, God can remove it all. That was the whole point of the cross. That was the whole point of Jesus coming here was to set us free. And until we actually believe that Jesus has set us free, we're going to continue to remain in, in bondage. Jesus came to serve. As crazy as this was, the four friends that dropped him down, Jesus still had to make himself available to serve that paralytic. And so he says in verse five, seeing their faith, he told the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Son, and I love this, your sins are forgiven. Now, who did this cause a problem for? This caused a problem for the religious, right? In verse six, some of the scribes, they were sitting there and they were thinking to themselves. So this is not even a conversation necessarily out loud. They're just, they're thinking to themselves. Now we know that these scribes back then were probably called lawyers. Okay, why? Because they studied the word of Moses and their role was, and rightfully so to some extent, their role was to check out this quote unquote new teaching. Hey, who's the new guy in the synagogue? Who's the new guy in our town? Who's the new guy? We need to make sure your, your saying lines up with the word. That's actually biblical but not to the point where you forget what scripture actually says. So in verse seven, remember, they're thinking to themselves, why does he speak like this? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? So this is what I conclude when I read this. They obviously don't know the Messiah or their view of the Messiah always was is that the Messiah could never forgive sins. That, that could have been because they obviously did not equate Jesus to being this. So they, they didn't think this would happen. And so here's what's crazy, you guys. They call, they call Jesus a blasphemer, right? Eventually, as Constable says, they're going to condemn Jesus to death for blasphemy again. When they first interact with him in Mark, blasphemy. Why? Well, because he's forgiving sins. That's only what God can do. And guess what they do at the very end of Mark? Blasphemy, and then they put him to death. And so this accusation always is leading to, to, to trouble. They didn't even call him. They're just thinking it. Yeah, they're just thinking, and that's the beautiful part about everything, right? So Jesus, he looks up, you know, as Kent Hughes says, he looks down. And then, and then I love this one. What, what else is he doing? He, he looked within, right? He looked within. He, he, he knows our hearts. He knows the religious. He knows the non he, he knows everybody's hearts. He looks within, and then right away it says in verse 8, right away Jesus understood in his spirit that they were thinking like this within themselves. And then he said to them, why, why are you thinking these things in your heart? We well, got to remember, only God can forgive sins. And so they refused to believe Jesus's power came from God. MacArthur said, much less is that he is God. So there's some major issues that are coming up to the table. Now it says he understood in his spirit. We're not talking about the Holy Spirit right here. Jesus understood in his spirit. We're just talking about, as one guy says, we're referring to the omniscient mind, okay, of the Savior. He's just all knowing. He, he knows these things. And this is where it gets fun to me. This is kind of like the game. I love when people can play this game and I love how they can talk. He says in verse nine, which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven or to say, get up, pick up your stretcher and walk. 
You guys got any thoughts on, on this dialogue? I'm always intrigued by this part. Why would he say this? I mean, which one is easier, you guys, to say? Your sins are forgiven or to get up and pick up your stretcher? I would say the latter. Based on his audience and the, and the scribes being there, they're going to think that your sins are forgiven, and I think that's why he, he did it, uh, the both there. Okay, what else? Any other thoughts? Kevin? I think it's hard for them to see the sins forgiven because that's, that's on the inside. And for them to see, you know, he's asking if, if, I, if you see somebody get up and walk that's paralyzed, you can see that with your eyes. You can't see. So well, but he didn't. He they they don't believe that he has the authority to forgive right. any sins. That would be the that would be in their case the high priest that would have to do that. So he's stepping on their toes in that respect. Right. Okay. Yes and no. I, I I appreciate your perspective, but here's what I also would say. But if he said your sins are forgiven, he could never prove it whether or not they are actually forgiven. So in some contexts, a lot of people would say it's easier to say your sins are forgiven because you can't prove it. You can say, oh, I forgave a sins. No, not you can't prove it that yes, it, it, they are or they're not. So it actually might even be harder to say, get up and pick up your stretcher and walk because you have to actually prove that, but you don't have to prove the other. And that's Jesus's point. He just says, I can get away with saying this, but the reality is if I say this, well, watch in verse 10, it says, but so you may know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Watch this. He told the paralytic because it's harder. He says, I'm going to tell you, get up, pick up your mat and go home. So because of the healing, then that actually proves the other statement. It's an interesting play on words and, 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 and really it, it's a tough way to look at it, but it's really kind of fun at the same time. I love to see there's this crazy tension though, isn't there? There's this tension of proving who he is with the people. And in fact, watch what he does. Okay, so immediately scripture says what? He got up. This is the, the paralytic. Kevin, I, I can't imagine being a paralytic. And then instantly, by the words and authoritative power of Christ, instantly he gets up, picks up the mat, went out in front of everybody. And as a result, everybody was astonished. Everybody, even that, that, that mentality, that word is, is everybody was out of their minds. Wait, this is the guy that just dropped through the roof. And then it says they gave glory to God. And they say, we've never seen anything like this. And I think it's fair to say all these people there, they wanted to experience a miracle. They wanted to experience a move of God. Why? Because they're pressing in at this house. Everybody's there. And yes, we have the religious. But overall, I think these people wanted to see this, which is why they're saying, whoa, we want this. It's pretty fun to watch. And then it says in verse 13, <laughs> it says, And Jesus went out again beside the sea, and the whole crowd was coming to him, and he taught them. In other words, what you're going to start seeing is, is everything just continues to take off. But what I want to do is I want to back up really quick. I want to show you in verse 10. I kind of want to land the plane on this one language, okay? And we're going to look at the Son of Man even more so uh, when we get into Je uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke. When we get into Luke, when we're talking, I had to go through my head here. We're going to get into the Son of Man. But why I want to do this is because I believe the Son of Man points to the servant. Now, the Son of Man, it, it, the reason that he calls himself this is to show, as MacArthur says, to show his humiliation. To show he is the son of man. What do you guys think that phrase even means? You guys got any thoughts? He identifies with us. Yeah, it's different. If he said son of God, he identifies more with, with God. <laughs> but with man, he's saying, I am with you. I'm a part of this. In fact, 14 times in Mark, he is listed as the son of man. Kevin, just as a couple pictures, can you go to verse, obviously in verse 10, can you go to verse 28, Mark 2, verse 28? It's a divine uh, Messiah, but he's also, this is a cool picture to me. I want to write this down. Son of man implies this. He's the divine Messiah and he is representative man. It's a kind of a weird phrase, but it makes sense. A representative man. And so what you have is a blend. So when he says the son of the man, son of man, this is what he's implying. I'm divine Messiah and I'm representing, I'm a representative man. Vincent Taylor came up with this. Look in Mark 2, 28. Therefore, the son of man is Lord even of the Sabbath. It keeps going. Mark 8, verse 31. If you'll go there. Then he began to teach them that the son of man, what? Must suffer many things 
and be subjected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes, be killed and rise up after three days. The Son of Man over the course of time will begin to show you his suffering. In fact, if you go to verse 38, Mark 8, verse 38. For whoever is ashamed of me, right, and of my words in this adulterous and sin gen sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Sorry, that it was verse 31 that talks about the suffering. Both of these, though, are in reference to the Son of Man. Over and over and over. Let's just do one more, Kevin, if we can. Go to Mark 13, verse 26, if you would. Mark 13, verse 26. Okay, then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then if you go to verse 32, here's the blend. Mark 13, 32. Now concerning that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son except the Father. Over and over again, Jesus begins to show himself in humiliation. He is here to serve mankind. That's what I love about the paralytic is that he is amidst all of the people. Like he, he just doesn't, he doesn't give up. And so there's this weird tension. I have this, it's kind of a longer quote, but this is how I want to, I want to close this. It says, so from the very beginning of the story, Jesus walks a tightrope. He's under constant threat and most evade incriminating charges until the right time. His narrow escape from such a serious charge early in the story, right? What is he being charged of? Blasphemy. So this narrow escape from a serious charge early in the story contributes significantly to the tension and suspense in this conflict. Jesus is constantly balancing out the God card and the man card. The God card and the man card. And in this story of the paralytic, I just, I love it because he, in, he puts himself in an environment where what? He can bring about healing. But he can only, not only can he bring about healing in the physical, but also he can restore the spiritual. The Son of Man, according to Mark 2, 10, he has authority on earth to forgive sins. And that's what he told the paralytic who was then set free. You know, there's a lot here in Mark 2, but hopefully this paints a picture of that people wanted to be around the servant, the Son of Man who could heal them and set them free. He looks up, he looks down, he looks within. And honestly, what I love is, is that he sets them free. Son, your sins are forgiven. All right, guys, uh, here's how I want to just, I want to encourage you. I, I don't know if you're the paralytic. I don't know if you are um, the friends, but just practically today, if you need help, here's what I want to challenge you with the story. If you need help, will you ask for it? Will you actually call out to one of your friends and say, you know what? I, I'm not doing good. I need prayer. But on the flip side, Maybe you're the, the friends and you see a friend hurting. You see a friend going through some tough times. Would you just not wait on them? And would you go to them and say, on behalf of our faith in Christ, we're here to help you. We're here to support you. Because you know what that means? That's when you begin to understand who the servant of Jesus Christ is. I don't know, it's real practical, but I just want us to walk this out every single day. And the only way that happens is if you're in the Word of God. All right, guys, that's Mark 1 and Mark 2. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Thanks. Thanks.